my man on the queue, bringing him on live now, the man himself, man of the hour, none other than Ed Ferrara. What's up, brother? What is going on, Tech? How you doing, man? Doing good. Yeah. Are you really okay? Everything sound good? Oh, everything sound good. Sound good. You know, got awesome. got got NFC Game Boy on and the Angry One, Angry Mark. Welcome What's to going on, Ed? What's going on, Pete? How's everybody doing tonight? We good, doing baby. Well. We good. Doing well. Good. Now, doing I'm well. Met, excellent. Now I met I met uh, I met NFC Game Boy, but I didn't meet Angry Mark out in Dallas, did I? No. No, no he. He's kind of a he's kind of an introvert. He doesn't really get out much. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I know where you we'll, live. We'll kind of... <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like he'll get out. He'll get out for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> now, you, now, Avery Mark wasn't in Dallas. He he was back at home handling business in PA. Uh huh. All right. But, uh, cool. Well, it's good. To, it's good to meet you, anyway, Angry Mark. Uh, uh, I don't have a face to go with the name, but that's that's cool. Two out of three ain't bad. No, that's <laughs> what I said when I got married. You know, she she met two of the three requirements. Sixty six percent. That's good enough to say I do. That's a winning <laughs> average. You, you you can't do better than that in some some circles. <laughs> well, thank you, Ed, for coming on. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, we were talking about basketball as we did talk about other things on the show. Not sure if you're a basketball <laughs> fan, but uh, if you wanted to chime in, uh, we were just saying who uh, who did you think was going to win Game Seven between uh, OKC or the Warriors? Actually, being the lameo that I am, I don't watch any. I don't watch basketball. Uh, um, but uh, I'm for uh, uh, whichever one two out of the three of you guys are for. How about that? We'll stick with that two out of the three. Okay. Oh. Man. Right. He's going Warriors. <laughs> you got the Warriors, man. Well, anybody, yeah, who's, when I, when anybody first, listening to this, you heard it first. Ed Ferrara is picking the Warriors. That's right. And I don't even know. I don't even know what that means. But yes, I am. I am picking the Warriors. War all the way with the Warriors. Uh, yeah, because when I first called up and I was in the queue. Because I know this is a you know blog talk radio, and I hear I hear voices talking about basketball, and I'm like, am I calling into the right damn show? Am I, am I in the right place? So that's why that's why I sent you that message. Says, oh, talking about <laughs> basketball. Am I in the right place, dude? Hey, right well, place. The, the reason for that is, is because you know usually when we talk Monday Night Raw, even though it's a three hour show, we usually wrap it up in ten. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Smackdown, we oh, wrap no, up in about one minute. Yeah. <laughs> All good. All good. So, what's up, guys? Well, thank you for coming on to the show, Ed. Um, you want to see, is it okay for to call you Ed, or is it another name you want us to call you by? No, Ed is absolutely fine. That is the name I go by. So, please, mm-hmm. by all means, call me Ed. Okay, well, I'm going to start it off with uh, the first question and then. I'll turn it over to uh, Game Boy. <clears throat> with you being a writer and booker in the WWE or WWF back then, uh, let us know what made your style different from opposed to Russo, from opposed to the other writers and bookers of that time. Hmm, that's a that's a good question. Um, uh, well, what made it different from other? writers at that time was, you know, I was coming in, I was coming in with experience as a, as a TV writer producer. And I was also coming in with experience in wrestling because I was also, I I wrestled indies in Southern California. So I had both sides of that. And I kind of, uh, you know, I, I don't know of a lot of people who have been hired by them that had that, that same type of pedigree. Um, now maybe a little bit more so because it's they they you know they hire about you know what seventy eight different writers uh, so who knows what what they've got but at, at that point there wasn't anybody that had that exact pedigree so I had that going for me um, and then as far as what what was uh, different from Russo I think that I think we complemented each other really well I mean we had we had different opinions on certain things. But general philosophy, we agreed on. The general philosophy was using logic, which was 
you know, really not the norm in the wrestling industry, especially at that point. You know, you always have you have, you have what we used to call wrestling logic, um, but you know, which you know, which is you know, wrestling logic being, uh, for example. You have, and, and this is not necessarily an example of something that we did or didn't do, but it's just an example to illustrate my point. Wrestling logic would be, you know, a guy's in the ring cutting a promo. Uh, his, his arch rival comes down the ramp and stands at the end of the ramp cutting a promo on him, and these guys hate each other, hate each other, hate each other. Well, why isn't one of them going to the other one? Why, what, what, something about the ropes, like they, the ropes create this invisible, bo- invisible force field that they can't penetrate. They, they have to keep the ropes between them. And, and it was, you know, we would always look at the characters and the stories and what, what they were doing with real-world logic. Like, if I was really pissed at him, what would I do? I would not let those ropes keep me away from him, so I would go after him. And it's things like that, and we used, we used that type of a logic to develop our storylines and to move them forward as opposed to just the old tried-and-true uh, tropes of, booking, you know, as they had been used for, for decades and decades. And I mean, you know, there was always that element there, but when we were writing the shows, we looked at the, we, we looked at each individual character as an individual character and we said, okay, what would Stone Cold Steve Austin do in this instance? What would Val Venus do in this instance? What would Mick Foley do in this instance? And that's where it came from. Not, it wasn't, we didn't come up with a match and say, how do we get to this match? Uh, um, we would come up with the storyline and we would let that take us to what the match was going to be, if that makes sense to you. Instead of booking the end and then working our way backwards, we worked our way forward through to the end. Okay. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Great analysis there. No Go it, uh, Game Boy. <laughs> okay. Well, Ed, first of all, thanks again for coming, Norm. It's a pleasure meeting you, man. I didn't realize how much taller I am than y'all, man. I mean, I was looking down and <laughs> <laughs> no, I was that's playing a, with that's you. A real, that's a really nice way of saying I didn't realize how short you were. So I really yeah, appreciate you, know, I, I, you I, putting <laughs> it that way, giving me, the, giving me the half full instead of the half empty. I appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, you know, when I, was, when I was hugging you and everything, I wanted to make sure, you know, I didn't want to hey, hug you too hey, much. Oh, so I wanted oh, to make we sure weren't going to talk about that. We weren't going to talk hey, about hey, that. Hey, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just putting it out there so the fans can know. But thanks again, man, for coming on. Um, no problem, my, man. My pleasure. My question to you is, is, is kind of piggyback off a text question. When you talked about your different styles and everything, I want to ask, what wrestler did you write that you thought that you complimented very, very well, who you felt like you brought out the best out of with your writing style? Me personally, I think I would have to go with, uh, at, that, at that time, I would have to go with Undertaker and Kane and the whole Ministry of Darkness and all that because I was always a horror guy and a comic book fan. Um, and that, I, that whole storyline when we did the ministry and, you know, had the Undertaker being the Lord of Darkness and all that, that just really, that, that just, I was able to really geek out on that. I mean, most of all, almost everything, it wasn't like I had certain characters and Russo had certain characters, um, but, uh, you know, we both did everything together. But um, the, uh, those, that was the one storyline or angle or character, what have you, that I really, you know, that would, that, if you would sum up my contribution, uh, I'd like to say that, that that's more in my wheelhouse than other stuff. Hmm. Oh, okay. All right, thank you, Ed. Thank you. Uh, Tech, back no to problem. you. Well, you, uh... with that being said, I'm going to turn over to Angry Mark. I know he, uh, his time is limited, so I know he's a little busy. <laughs> mm-hmm. so good, tag him in. Tag him. Yeah, hot tag. Good. Hot tag to Angry Mark. Keep the uniform so, Ed, going. Uh, you, yeah. you were there for the Attitude Era. Everybody already knows that. What I want to know is I want to know how the approach went down and who reached out to you when you made your decision to jump ship and go to WCW. That was actually um, – all right, let me see, let me let me see if I can if I can if I can synopsize this a little bit. Um, long story short, at that point, uh, Russo and I were both feeling very overworked, very underappreciated for different reasons. Uh, um, Underpaid. And, 
Uh, no, I wouldn't say underpaid, but you got to take into account the fact that they had just announced that SmackDown was going to be a new weekly series, and we were just basically told that. It was essentially we came into work one day, and it, you know the long and short of it was, hey guys, guess what? Your workload just doubled, um, and with no, you know, nobody talking about more money at that point, and you know that is something that I really didn't worry about. Um, you know, Vince was always very good about taking care of us money-wise. Uh, and if, you know, once once we had gotten into the swing of things with SmackDown, I have no doubt that, that more money would have been coming our way. However, at the time, because we were still feeling underappreciated, uh, uh, the, it, the fact that we weren't even told in advance, uh, nobody even approached us and said, hey, you know, what what's the feasibility of this? What would you guys need to do? or what would you guys need in order to make this work? I mean, it was just, we were just informed, which, you know, hey, it's their company. That's what they can do. But if they really want the same level of quality that we were putting in raw, uh, if they wanted that into a second show each week, you know, that was just too much to do. So uh, I'm, I'm digressing, sorry. Uh, uh, so so we, were, we were at a point where we were both kind of down on, on, on our jobs at that point. Um, Russo had sent out some feelers uh, to WCW, or he had some feelers sent to him, or uh, uh, I don't know exactly how it worked out, but I know that one day, uh, it, was a, it was a Thursday or a Friday, um, I think it was a Friday morning, and Russo called me and said, look, I just want you to let you know what's going on. Um, you know, I, I'm flying down to Atlanta. Um, I, I am going to talk with Bill Bush. Um, you know, I had some feelers sent out, and this this meeting was set up. And if all goes the way I think it's going to go, I'm going to sign with them. And I don't want you to to you know be surprised by this or hear about this anywhere else. And I told him in that same conversation, I said, "Dude, um, I don't know where your head is at on me, but um, if you if you would like me to join you, uh, um, by all means, please throw my name out there." When you're when you're when you're with them tomorrow, because I know that I will not last two weeks on my own here. Uh, uh, I was already I was already burnt out. I had already had um, enough uh, much Vinnie Mac as I could handle at that point. Um, so I I I knew that the, the writing was on the wall for me if I stayed. Um, so he went down there. He called me back that afternoon. He said, yep, they are, they are very interested in you. And they had bought me a ticket, and I flew down the next day. And we, the, the two of us met with uh, Bill Bush and uh, some other uh, uh, WCW and Turner executives on Sunday afternoon. We signed our contracts, and uh, we flew home that night. And that was, that was what had happened. But it was it, – you know, basically getting back to the answer of the question, it was, you know, we were feeling underappreciated and overworked and we needed to make a change and we had to look out for ourselves because it was very clear that nobody else was. So, um, and, and mind you, we didn't have any no competes. There was no, no, no compete clause in our contracts because we didn't have contracts, um, which I thought was very foolish when I first signed with them uh, about 18, 19 months before then, when I had first signed with WW, WWF, um, I, you know, I was, a, I was a TV writer producer in Los Angeles and everything is through contracts. And I said, when they first hired me, are we going to drop a contract for this? And they said, no, no, we, we don't do things like that because as far as they were concerned, I was just an employee and my employee, you know, my, my job position was writer. So I said, okay, that's fine. We could do that, I guess. I, I mean, it made me uneasy, uh, and rightfully so, you know, because if you sign a contract, then you're beholden to somebody. A contract works both ways, and they wanted to be able to, well, if it doesn't work, just let me go, uh, which, you know, most companies will do that. Um, mm-hmm. And then at another point in my tenure there, I had said, hey, um, do we want to do a contract? Do we, want to, do we want to sign contracts? And they said, no, nope, no, nope, that's not how we do things. And, okay, fine. So then when the time came and we decided we had had enough, there was absolutely nothing keeping us there. We didn't have a contract. We didn't have a no compete. 
nothing. And and that I think was uh, uh, you know kind of came from arrogance that they they would think well why would anybody leave here why would why would you ever not want to be working here uh, as long as we want to have you and you know it it very quickly showed showed itself to be quite the opposite and it worked to our advantage. Well, I have a kind of a double follow up on that. So you you sign your contracts on Sunday, you and Russo, for WCW. Uh-huh. You fly back. How uh-huh. do you resign your position from WWF? And how did that go down? Uh, very quickly and very awkwardly. Uh, what happened was we um, we were flying back from Atlanta to Connecticut. Um, let me see. We were flying back to, to uh, Connecticut from Atlanta. Um, we had, uh, the way that they booked us, I think we had, uh, no, we didn't have a changeover. We just got into the, uh, the airport in Connecticut. Before we went anywhere, Vince, you know, this was before I think we even had cell phones. Vince went over and, and used a pay phone and called Vince McMahon because they expected us to be at TV the next morning. The next morning, TV was going to be at the Meadowlands, which was just a drive from home wasn't travel. We didn't have to fly or anything like that. So we, he expected us to be a TV the next morning. And knowing that we had just signed with the competition, we had just, quote, unquote, defected to the enemy, um, there, you know, I, you know, there's no way they would have wanted us backstage at TV. So Vince called him and Vince said, look, let me, talk, let me call him tonight. You call him in the morning. Let's not hit him with everything all at once. Um, and out of respect for Vince, I said, sure, he has a much longer relationship with Vince McMahon. Uh, so he called him uh, um, and told him, and Vince apparently was, you know, he was in shock. At first he thought it was a joke, um, and then uh, he, was in, he was absolutely in shock. Um, you know, I, I can't really speak to that conversation, but then the next morning I called Vince. I called Vince on his cell um, when he was in the car on the way to – the Meadowlands, and you know, basically, I told him, Vince, uh, uh, I just want to let you know, um, I was with Vince and I signed with them too, so uh, I'm assuming that you're not going to want us at TV. And it was a very quick conversation, it was very abrupt. I wish you all, wish you all the best, good luck to you, thank you for everything, goodbye. Um, and that was it. And the thing was, you know, Vince Russo had told him, and I said, Look, Vince, you got the show, it's, it's, you, we wrote the show, we wrote next week's show. You're set. We had gotten everything, you know, all the angles were in line for like the next eight weeks easily. Um, so it wasn't like we were leaving them in the lurch without a show for the next day. But, you know, there's no way you could give a two-week notice in this industry. There's no way. There's no way that they would want to spy this because then automatically we would be, you know, we would be spying for the competition because we're now under the employment of WCW, so they're not going to want to pitch during the shows. So it was it was the sort of thing where there couldn't have been a two week notice. You couldn't have done anything like that. So, with that being said, what would did you sign a contract with WCW, or you, were you one of the smart smart guys who signed with the network? Um, no, I well the thing is, I, it wasn't a matter of being smart. I signed the contract that they put in front of us uh, uh, that Sunday. <laughs> Um, and the, uh, from what I remember, I think it was a contract. You know, I don't even know. I, I don't even remember who it was with, if it was with Turner or if it was with WCW. I know that when they, when WWE bought out WCW at the end, I know that, um, you know, I got paid out the balance of my contract, and my contract was assumable by WWF. If they wanted me, they could have taken my contract, and I had heard from the lawyer at WCW that they did want me, and she and I had asked her if there was any way, if she hears anything of that, to try and get me out of it. I said because I have no desire to work for them anymore. If I wanted to work for WWE, I would, would never have left. Um, so, um, they could have assumed my contract. She got me out of it somehow and I got paid out the balance of my contract, but they could have very easily have assumed my contract, continued to pay me and just like assigned me to WWE Siberia or, or whatever. And they could have done what they wanted and then pushed me to the point where I would have quit. 
Um, luckily, the way that the lawyer worked it or discussed it, I was able to just basically sit out the balance of my contract, uh, which went to like October of that year. So it was like April through October. Oh. Well, thanks. I'll turn it back over to Tech. Thank you for answering that. No problem. Oh. Man. No problem. Well, All thanks right. for that. Hey, you said um, working in WWE, you felt burnt out. Give me an example of <clears throat> when did you realize you were burnt out, and did that really affect your performance in WWE? Did you still give your hundred percent, or were you so burnt out the way you just you just couldn't do much anymore? Well, it was kind of a, kind of both because uh, you know I, I to my knowledge it never really affected my performance because I'm I'm a pro and I don't let things like that affect my performance, but it was affecting my person. It was affecting my psyche. It was affecting my emotions. It was affecting how I felt about myself. Um, and, yeah, uh, there was one point when I was about a year in to my tenure there, maybe a little more than a year, but I had had it. I, I, I had had it with the travel, with the schedule, with, you know, being on call 24-7, 365, uh, with not being able to have a life of my own. Um, I, just, I just had had it, and I went to Vince one day, Vince McMahon, and I basically, when we, it was a booking meeting with me, him, and Vince Russo, and I had already told Russo about this, um, and I said, Vince, I, I've got to thank you very much for hiring me for giving me the opportunity and for, for, you know, letting me work with you here. But I said, I can't do this anymore. Um, this is, it's too much for me. I don't have a life. I, I'm, uh, I just, I outlined everything that I just said. And Vince said to me, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I would like you to think about it. Um, think about what it would take for us to keep you. Um, because I don't want to lose you. Um, you know, take the week off, you know, no strings attached, just take the week off. Go take your wife, go on a little vacation, go somewhere, do something, um, recharge your batteries, and think. Think about what you would want, uh, what it would take to keep you. Mm-hmm. So I did that. And um, I went back to him the following week, and I said, okay, I, I know what I want. Um, you know, because at this point we were traveling every week, and I said, look, I, uh, first thing I want is I want to travel less. I, I want to travel once a month. I said, uh, for every other week, I will be on call when you guys are at TV. If you need something written, you can just call me and I will write it and I will email it to you or what have you. Um, but I just don't want to have to deal with the travel and and the uh, being on the road. That was just getting to be too, too much for me. Um, I said, I'll travel once a month and I'll go, you know, the weekend when it's the pay-per-view. So that way it's, you know, I'm, I'm there for, you know, you've got three days of shows and you're getting, you know, it's the, it's the busiest, uh, the busiest taping of the month. So I'll do right. that one. That's the one I'll do, but I, I, I don't want to do any others. Uh, and then the other thing was, I, I want you to double my salary. And, and he, without skipping a beat, he said, okay, you got it. And, Part of me in the back of my mind went, damn it, because I was kind of <laughs> hoping that it would be, well, we can't do that, and, you know, no hard feelings, but he did it, and then, but interesting side note, you know, I got that, and I was only traveling once a month, and I was only, and, and, and it was, and it was traveling, and it was also only going to TV once a month, just because those days, the days of TV were just absolutely brutal, and, you know, they, they were, they were, they were, you know, taking years off my life, so, Um, The interesting side note is the night that Russo and I signed with WCW, if you remember, I said that we were going to be in the Meadowlands the next morning, um, which was a TV. Um, I got home, and I listened to the messages on on my answering machine, because back in the day we had answering machines. I listened to messages on my answering machine when I got home, and there was a message from Vince's assistant, Vince McMahon's assistant, uh, uh, telling me that Vince expected to see me at TV the next day. And I had just been at TV the week before. Um, But because it was Meadowlands, he was like, well, this isn't travel, and I want you at TV. So he already was about to start picking away at our agreement and, and, and kind of invalidating our agreement. So that just made me feel like, 
uh, I made the right choice in signing for WCW. Uh, right. uh, but, of course, then everything else about my employment with WCW seemed to indicate otherwise. Mm-hmm. Hey. Wow, that's, that's a, what, when you said, and I'm, I'm going to turn over the game with to this, when you said it was becoming too much, it, it, go a little more in-depth about the travel. Is it How much sleep did you get? Uh, you know, give us a view of your day in general being at the office. You know, we've okay. you know, we've had you know, we've had JJ Dillon on our show before and others and he mentioned how same thing he was getting burnt out, just to be calling mm-hmm. them all hours of the night. It was the twenty four seven job. Did you deal with the same thing? Uh yes. Different different things than JJ, but yes, very much the same because don't forget, back then you know, Vince Russo and I, we traveled with Vince McMahon. We were attached to his hip. So what did we do? You know, let's, let's say like a typical travel schedule. Say we're going we're gonna to fly somewhere. Let's just say it's not, not somewhere on the other side of the country, but a, like an hour and a half flight uh, for Monday Night Raw. Say we're going to be in uh, Baltimore or something like that. Um, so Vince Russo and I would have to get to Vince McMahon's house in Greenwich, Connecticut, at like, oh, you know, five in the morning um, because we would have to work with him in the limo on the way to the airport. We would go over the entire show for that evening. So we're going over the show uh, uh, from top to bottom, and uh, in, the, in, the, in the limo, we get to the airport, we get on the plane, and then, of course, while we were in flight, Vince wanted to go over the show again and go over the whole thing from top to bottom, go over different individual section segments and make sure that we were all on the same page. And, you know, if he had any other ideas or if he wanted, if something all of a sudden wasn't good enough anymore. Uh, so we did that on the flight. And then we would get in the car with him and we would go to the building. And if we were early enough and we didn't have a production meeting just yet, you know, usually the production meeting was at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, if we were there early enough, we would have time to go into Vince's office and for a change of pace go over the show uh, from top to bottom. And then we would have the production meeting. And the whole point of the production meeting is you bring everybody in, the agents, the TV production people, uh, props, what have you, uh, um, and you would go over the show from top to bottom. You'd go over everything we were going to do, so that way everybody knew what we were going to do on the show that night. And then after the production meeting, we would go and huddle up with Vince McMahon in his office and go over the show from top to bottom, make sure that we all knew what, what we were doing, make sure there weren't any last changes before we would go out and produce the, the pre-tape segments. So then... Vince Russo and I would split up the pre-tape segments that needed to be shot. He would go and produce his list. I would go and produce my list. um, And we would get those done usually minutes before the show went live. Um, We would do the show. And then during the show, we would often have live shots that we would need to produce. So we would do that. Um, And somewhere in here, we would find a minute to throw some food down our neck. Um, And then after the show... After the show, then we would climb into the the rental SUV with Vince McMahon and usually uh, Shane and Stephanie, and Vince would want to, as we drove to the next town, because that's what we would do, because the next town would always be like two and a half hours away from the town we were in Monday night. The Tuesday night town would be two and a half hours away, so we would drive that night um, to get to the, the town for the next day's taping. And in the car the whole way there, Vince would want to go over the next night's show from top to bottom. And then we would get to the hotel and check in. And sometimes Vince would want to to huddle up in his room before we went to sleep and go over the show from top to bottom. And then we would get up early and have breakfast in his freaking room and go over the show again. And then we would go to the TV, to go to the venue, have the production meeting, go over the show. Are you getting a feel for the, for the grind and why I had to get the hell out of there? That it feels like to me that I'm you weren't that busy. Exaggerating. That's the thing. I, I mean, I'm making a joke about it by saying, you know, do over the show from top to bottom, but I'm not exaggerating. That is what we would do every week. Every single week we would do that. So about 100 hours. <laughs> Easily. And we would get maybe, maybe five hours of sleep that night. Maybe. 
Did you I have a have family, a like wife and kids at home at the time? <laughs> no, I did not. That's the thing. I had I had my wife, and we had two little dogs. And that, you know, it, because that's the thing. If I had had kids, no way. I wouldn't have lasted as long as I did. Um, but I had a very, very patient wife. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, i got to say she was pretty happy when I was doing that. Yeah, because I would say you wouldn't have had time to try and have kids on that schedule. I would have been sleeping. Unless you brought No, and the thing is, Russo Russo had three kids, which, you know, is crazy, absolutely crazy. And he wasn't, you know, he wasn't getting to see them. You know, his kids were growing up. He wasn't getting to see them. And, and, you know, one part of the – and he's told this story a million times, so I can tell it uh, without it being telling tales out of school. But one of the reasons why – uh, uh, he he particularly was feeling unappreciated uh, when we right before we made the jump. He went to Vince McMahon one day and told him all this and told him, you know, I miss my kids, I can't see my kids, and you know, Vince and Vince McMahon's whole response was, well, I pay you enough, you know, why don't you hire a nanny? And when Vince McMahon told him that, told Russo that, that was when Russo knew, okay. All right, this this I I can't do this. I'm I'm giving my life to this person. Um, I'm coming to this person with my heart in my hand, and uh, they're, they're clearly his priorities and, and what he, he is not concerned about. What I need to be concerned with. So I've got to get out of here. Mm. Wow. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the well, glamorous well, life. The glamorous life of the pro wrestling writer. <laughs> did your hands cramp up? I mean, did, did you did you ever doze off during the meetings? I mean, did you sneeze? <laughs> did you, well, yeah, yeah, we we were oh, told you can't sneeze <laughs> around Vince. Yeah, you yeah, no, all say, did Yeah, yeah. It's weakness. It shows weakness. Well, here's the thing. It's also you know at that point I uh, I had very few F's uh, uh, left in my tank, um, and, and at that point I was very I was I was a heavy smoker. And that, I know, drove Vince McMahon insane, insane, because he hated cigarette smoking. He hated smokers. And he would just, every time I would come into a room from having had a cigarette outside or something, smelling like a cigarette, he would just give me a dirty, dirty look. And in my mind, I'm like, I don't give a shit. Go ahead. What are you going to do, fire me because I had a cigarette? You can give me a dirty look all you want, but my addiction is stronger than my fear of that dirty look. <laughs> well, I gotta say, Vince McMahon is a very eccentric guy. For him to have that many meetings at that little bit of time of the same mm-hmm. thing over and over again, that'll drive anybody insane. <laughs> so I can understand. <laughs> I can understand <laughs> why you left. Cause <laughs> yeah, you know. I wish that they would have a few more meetings nowadays, though, from what I'm seeing on TV. That's, that's, the, that's the thing. I, I really can't imagine the Vince McMahon that I worked with, the Vince McMahon that we worked with, and that same guy being responsible for what we see now on Monday nights. It's just I, I, can't, I can't think that up in my head. Mm. Well, you know what? Don't worry about it. The, stock, the stockholders feel the same way. <laughs> so, so don't 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 trip on that one. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, no, the only thing I'm there... tripping on is I left the. The only thing I'm tripping on is I left the company before I got a chance to get some of that sweet stock. Because I'm sure I would have if I had been with the company long enough, and I'd be sitting pretty right now. But instead, no. All I got is I got. I I just got out. That's what I got. Out. So, is is there any more do's and don'ts? First, the don'ts around Vince. We was told by a friend in, in the business that still works within WWE, you can't sneeze around Vince. What is it? You can't mm-hmm. smoke around Vince. Uh, somebody told oh, the story God. how yeah. Jesse Ventura, like he, Jesse Ventura, like Vince hated hated smoke. How the, was it the SummerSlam when Ventura was the uh, was the referee? How Jesse purposely yep. smoking a cigar and blew it in Vince's face. <laughs> Vince could <laughs> Did Russo but tell that story when he was on? No, no, it wasn't Russo. I'm trying to think who. Um, it, 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 we was at a show. One of the boys. You know, how you run into a lot of people. Somebody right, right, right. around the WWE at that time told us that story about Ventura smoking the. the uh, I don't know if it was, was it was Nash, 
it, it might have been Nash or Hall. I think it was some Nash Hall, Pac, somebody from the Click, or it could have been um, one of the one of the former agents told us. Could have been Steamboat. I'm about to say, man, we mm-hmm. forgot. We we interviewed. Yeah, him. we forgot. It's, <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> and they, 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 vividly, that's well, how we, we realized forgot. that Vince. Vin it's a long movie. laundry list of people. Yeah. <clears throat> but and, um, but what are some more? What are some more that don't surround Vince? You can't smoke. You can't sneeze. Um, you can't smoke, you can't sneeze. Um, well, I mean, you know the famous one. You know, it's not a, it's not a belt, it's not a strap, it's a championship. Um, uh, uh, you, you, you can't. Um, well, I mean, just being sick. The, 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 the thing was there. You know, the, the, the saying that we would always have is there is no sick. Um, Vince didn't care if you were, if you, you know, if, if it was a Monday and it was, it was TV. Um, you, you know, you, there's no such thing as being sick. You are doing your job. So, I mean, there was, there was a couple of times that Russo, uh, I, I luckily, you know, never got really sick. I was always, you know, because I smoked, I always had head colds and sinuses and stuff like that. But, like, there was one time when Russo had a terrible, he had the flu, and he was at TV with the flu, like sitting on a road cart, on a road case with a blanket around him, shivering, as he's writing promos and going over promos with people. Um, but because there's, you know, there is no sick. So just like, just like uh, you can't sneeze, you, 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 you know, you can be sick, but don't let anybody know it. Don't show it. Don't sell it because, because he doesn't care. Nobody cares. So you're um, real sick. This fight is, 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 is bring the gurney and the IVs up in the office for you on the hospital bed. Can't call off sick at all. Yeah. Yeah, nope, no calling out sick. I mean, when you've got TV, be sick on your time. And that, that's the ironic thing is because when you're, especially at the level that we were working with him, there is no such thing as your time because he could call at any given any given point. I, 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 we had countless, like, conference call slash meetings on Sunday nights before we're going to leave for TV the next morning. You know, get a call out of the blue on a Sunday night and end up on the phone for three hours. Um, and what were we doing? Going over the show. What did you think we would be doing? That's what we do. Well, goddamn. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> that, that is, that is a goddamn. Yeah, I'm like, well, you can't do nothing now. <laughs> I, you know, I, it, by, you, by you saying this, it, I think back to the CM Punk interview, and now mm-hmm. I'm starting to really realize that, you know, these guys, because, you know, when you get sick on your job or you get sick at school or you just get sick in general, everybody try to comfort you because, you know, it's, you're sick. You know, if you mm-hmm. get too sick, you can actually die. But when you're in an environment <laughs> when they just don't care, you know, it, yeah. <laughs> like, God, you know, is it really well, is also- the money really that much? Well, well, here's the thing, and this is this is where it gets, you know, this is where the the, 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 the you're talking about shades of gray, because there, it's not like it was an official policy. It's not like there is any any you know there's any rule that says you can't take time off. You know, they could never do that or say that because of the fact that you know that that's just that's against the law, but. The culture is such that everybody there walks on eggshells, and it's more so, from what I understand, more so now than when we were there, but everybody walks on eggshells, and everybody, you know, you know, at least back in my day, the big thing was everybody was, you know, wanted Vince's approval, wanted Vince's favor, and didn't want to do anything that would make him displeased with them. And that goes for, you know, the TV production people who would be, you know, basically living in the production facility because they're working around the clock because we're cranking out so much material that they have to edit and packages they have to put together. Um, uh, To the boys who, you know, if you you, uh, uh, show any weakness, you know, you might lose some favor with Vince. And when it comes time to pick somebody to put into a, to a certain angle, maybe he wouldn't think of you uh, if he, if he, you know, had uh, for whatever reason 
uh, you had expressed displeasure in you at some point. So it's just, it's, it's nothing official, but it's just it's that type of an environment and that type of a culture. Um, you know, you've, you've got, you've got people who are, you know, working around the clock for you. And, and it's really hard to, you know, it's, it's not like Vince is expecting this from people and he doesn't do it himself. I mean, Vince McMahon was always the first guy to arrive at the arena and the last one to leave, which sucked because we traveled with him, might I add. Um, but he's, you know, he's not a guy who would show up late and leave early and expect everybody to bust their ass while he's drinking champagne and, uh, you know, and, and partying. I mean, he was, he's a hard worker. He is driven, but it's his company. He owns it, but he kind of expects that same dedication from his employees. Um, and the ones who show that dedication, they're the ones that usually will stick around longer. And the ones who don't, um, they, they, they won't work out. I mean, it's, that's, just, that's just the culture. At least that's what it was in my experience. And from what I hear now, it's not that different. Okay, so, well, well, Ed, let me ask you this. We've uh-huh. interviewed we've – interviewed Many, many people, both fans, both uh, uh, performers, wrestlers, referees, everyone loved the Attitude Era. Everyone. Every, everyone always speak about the Attitude Era. As you know, as Vince know, everyone loved the Attitude Era. Every other era, they really don't care about unless they just guys that grew up in the 70s and the 80s, and, and even they would probably compare it to the Attitude Era. Why right. is the Attitude Era the quintessential of writing? when it comes to professional wrestling? Um, I think it's because uh, for a couple of reasons. And one, one reason I think, I think that there's a lot of romanticizing going on. I mean, not to take anything away from the Attitude Era, because that wasn't just the writing. It wasn't just Vince and I. It was also, you had, you know, you had the Monday Night War going on, so it was just ex- an exciting time to be a fan. You also had you know, at least on the WWE side with what we were working with, we had just like the most stacked, unbelievable roster. You know, we had Austin and The Rock at the same time, two of the, two of the, the three biggest draws in the history of the business. And we had them on the same roster at the same damn time. So, I mean, you, you, you can't go wrong with that. Um, now, couple that with the fact that for the first time in decades, we were doing things differently. We were doing, we were, we were appealing to a more mature audience. Uh, well, let's say maybe not more mature, but maybe an older audience. Uh, okay. Cause some of the okay. stuff we did was, some of the stuff we did was pretty damn immature, but it was fun. Um, okay. <laughs> we were, we were appealing to an older audience. We weren't going, we were also, we were, we were, you know, letting logic rule the booking rather than just booking a wrestling show. We were writing stories. You know, we had stories for every single, every single character slash wrestler on the roster. We had a story for them. It wasn't just, it wasn't just you had, you know, you had the, the whatever the main event program is, you have one other program, and that's pretty much it. No, we had everybody had something going on. And we did a lot of crisscrossing. Like, we would have numerous storylines play out in the same segment of television. So there was an element of you can't look away for a minute because you might miss something. You might miss something really cool or you might miss something really significant. So because when we wrote the show, we wrote it with the, with the uh, uh, assumption that the viewer was sitting there watching our show with the remote control in their hand, ready to click away the minute they got comfortable or bored with whatever we were putting on the air. So that was the, 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 the main philosophy that we were working underneath, uh, within. Uh, we, were, we were trying to keep anybody from looking away for a second. Um, so that's what made the shows really fast-paced. That's what made, made us have so much going on. Now, uh, what suffered at this point was, and this is the, the, the criticism of the Attitude Era, and it'd be difficult to, difficult to deny it, is, you know, is the wrestling suffered because there was a lot of old school uh, uh, tropes and philosophies of old school like wrestling booking that we went against. 
Um, we did things faster. We didn't draw things out as much as we could have. Uh, um, I won't say as much as we should have, but as much as we could have. Um, and, you know, we, we, we didn't write it like we were rest, like we were bookers. We wrote it like we were writing a TV show. Um, and I think that was the main reason why it stands out from so many other periods in the, in the, 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 the business's history. Um, and, uh, and we also were looking to, you know, we were, we were taking that crash TV attitude where anything could happen and you, and, and you can't afford to miss a second. Um, and and uh, for whatever work or whatever, for whatever it was, it worked. Um, it worked for the time that we were there, and it worked uh, really well. It brought the brought the uh, the product up to levels that have not been seen since. Um, and because it became a mainstream pop culture phenomenon, um, and like I said, and that was a result of the perfect storm. Besides the fact that you had this new creative uh, approach to the product and approach to the show. You also had an incredible roster. You also had, you know, JR as the, as the head of talent relations and the voice of the show, uh, which just, you know, brought it to a whole other level. And we weren't afraid to try anything. We, we would just, we would try whatever came to mind, whatever we, we could, we would try it because you know, it's hard to come up with two hours worth of worth of compelling TV when you write it at the pace that we write it. Nowadays, they have matches that go three segments, 28 minutes for a match. You know, back then, our matches, they, they you know, it was, a, it was a rare match that went more than six or seven minutes uh, because we had so much other stuff we were trying to cram into every segment because that's what happens when you try and tell stories with everybody on the roster. But the flip side of that is, when you try and tell stories with everyone on the roster, when you put them in the ring, the audience now suddenly cares about that match. It's not cold. They have a reason to be dialed in to what the, what the talent is doing in the ring because they've been following the story that's been told in the weeks up until that moment. Mm. Well, you know, it, this just goes to show of what a lot of people call a perfect storm. Because some people will say the writing was great and the writing made that error. Then some people will say, well, the wrestling and the stars and the personalities, the charisma made it, and the story was just there. I think it's a combination of both. But here's a question that I've always asked. I've asked Vince this. I've asked many other wrestlers this. And by you being in that perfect storm, I'm going to ask for your opinion on this, because that's what it is. It's your opinion. Yeah. Why isn't it no black world heavyweight champions, or excuse me, WWE heavyweight champions in the Attitude Era? That's an excellent question. Um, and what I would say to that is, as far as who is champion and who is heavyweight champion, that comes down to there's only one person who can decide that, and that's Vince McMahon. Um, what we would do is we would try and tell the most compelling stories possible. When guys got over, and we tried to get every single guy on that roster over, um, when guys got over, they would get used more, and they would get elevated. Um, but you can't put the championship on somebody who hasn't elevated, well, <laughs> well, you shouldn't put the championship on somebody who hasn't elevated to the point where that's within the realm of possibility and where they will make a good, I mean, there's lots of other, cho- uh, lots of other factors that go into, by the way, selecting, you know, who's going to be a world champion. It's not just who the fans are responding to, which, you know, these days doesn't even seem to be a consideration. Uh, uh, if you want to look at both Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan, it doesn't seem like anybody's listening to what the fans are, but we did. Back then, Russo and I would go out into the house uh, numerous times throughout the night because we wanted to feel the reaction from the crowd to different things we were doing and different, different talents when they were going out there. So 
a world champion has got to be over with the fans to a certain extent, to a, to a large extent. He's got to be one of the most over guys on the roster, if not the most over guy on the roster. But in, in, as well as that, has to be somebody who uh, will be able to handle that because that's a big responsibility. And when they put the belt on somebody, uh, it's got to be somebody that that – is going to be able to go that extra nine nine yards, uh, that, that extra that extra mile, and make all the talk show appearances, and and do a lot more press, and be the face of the company. Um, and you know, it, it, to me, it never was an issue of race or not. It was just everybody was a character, and we were working with the characters who were more over. Uh, uh, or working, you know, working with the characters, getting the characters over, and whoever got over the most, those would be the ones that we would push. Push, you know that, or if it was storyline, like at one point in there, you know, Kane was we, we put the belt on Kane, but that was a transitional thing. Um, mm-hmm. But even then, Kane was still pretty damn over. This was the very, you know, this was still early in his run. He had only been around for a year or two at this point. And he was red hot. He was feuding with Austin and The Undertaker. And that whole three-way feud was red hot. Um, you know, the closest we came was Rock at WWE. But then before we left WCW, of course, you know, we, we had had, you know, and I know Russo had his eye on Booker T. And we were just glad that we could do that before, before that company shit to bed. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's – I – I think the bottom line is it's, the, the world champion has got to be somebody that Vince believes in and somebody that Vince uh, uh, wants. And I'm not saying that Vince doesn't want uh, an, a, a, a black world champion. Uh, I just don't think, you know, I think that if he, if there was somebody who he saw that in, he would do it. But I don't think he's seen it. Now, is that fair? I don't necessarily think so because I think it's very subjective. But that's the that's the, the bottom line. You know, the, the world champion, that's his action figure. He gets to put whatever head on it that he wants. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's not going to happen unless he unless he's feeling it. And that's, like I said, that's why we're at where we're at with Roman Reigns right now. And that's why Daniel Bryan, you know, it took him forever to get to that point because Vince just wasn't feeling it. Um, I don't know that for a fact because I wasn't there, but I've worked with Vince. I worked with Vince long enough to feel very confident in saying that. Did that well, answer your question? I, well, that, that answered my question, Ed, and I greatly appreciate it. And, and I know a lot of the fans who are listening, either live or archived, I know they they appreciate that answer. You were fundamental at a time in the WWE or DDF, whereas I know that what you're saying with pure confidence that that's pretty much what's going on right now in the WWE, only because you've been around the man with 20 uh, different meetings in one day talking about the same storyline. If you're doing that week in, week out for numerous years, you just you gain a, a, a understanding with a person because you're with them constantly. So yeah. with that being said, I, I, I definitely understand also on our show, we, we interviewed J.R., Jim Ross, last year, and I asked him the same question. And mm-hmm. um, he, he took a minute to pause, and when he came, he said, well, do you see any African-American wrestlers? This wasn't verbatim, but pretty much the gist of it. He said, do you see any African-American wrestlers who could carry the company? And when he say carry the company, that's which is a much that you, which is a much more which is a much more concise way of what I was trying to say. Exactly, Jim said it exactly. much better than I did. Jim was always better at sound bites than I was. Yeah, it, exactly. You know, he said, "Can you carry the company?" It's a difference between winning a belt and carrying the company. Yeah. This is my answer to that. If you have a machine behind you, then you can carry the company whatever you want because the machine is pushing you. The same machine that we have in music, the same machine we have in movies. The same machine we have in literature with newspapers and everything. If a machine is behind you and is telling the fans and is telling the people to resonate and get behind you, whatever, right, they like it or not, they're going to do it. You know, there's a lot of people, which is myself, who are not big Roman Reigns fans. Mm-hmm. But eventually Roman Reigns is going to get to that level where 
he's going to you're going to have to like him because you've been seeing him too much. The same thing that happened with John Cena. Mm-hmm. The difference is is that I never seen the machine behind us. And the reason why it hurts, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, is because I have a son. My son loves mm-hmm. wrestling. He 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 adores wrestling. You know, every mm-hmm. when he talk wrestling, he's he's about to be seven. He loves wrestling. He loved wrestling ever since he was two, three years old. And it kind of hurts that when he watches wrestling, he see performers in other federations and other promotions and stuff winning titles. You yep. see it in, in TNA. You see it in Ring of Honor. You know, mm-hmm. and when you talk about the WWE, which is an international company now, mind you, it's international. When you're talking about the WWE, you mean to tell me when you go to all these different places in around the world, you you see all these different faces, all these different uh, uh, groups of individuals of different cultures and stuff. You mean to tell me that this machine can't conjure up? a champion that looks like myself for my son to look up to. That That's what you're telling me. I find that very hard to believe, especially living in a place where united we stand, divided we fall. If my president can make it to the top, you mean to tell me that this machine cannot get behind someone such as myself or someone that looks like me? and can't get to the top. We can win tag titles, and we can win intercontinental belts, and we can go out there and, and jump off ladders and chairs and, and have hell in the cells and cage matches and all. We can do all that stuff and and, 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 and dance and gyrate and stuff and skip down and all. We, we can do all that stuff, and it's, and it's fun as dandy because, you know, you do what you got to do. You're here to entertain. But you mean to tell me after all these years, no one can reach that pinnacle? I just find it really peculiar, hey. especially with someone who's not involved in it as much as, as as we're saying he probably is with the product that we see today. So you ask mm-hmm. yourself, is it really Vince yeah. McMahon, or is it just the company itself? Right. Well, don't forget also that Vince McMahon sets the tone for the company. He, even though they're, it's a different company now than what I worked for. You know, when I, I when I worked for him, it was a mom and pop company. Now it is a you know a, 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 a corp. You know, they went they're, they're publicly traded corporation. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's a very different company. But I stu- I refuse to accept that Vince McMahon does not set the tone. Um, and it because what we get on TV is a result of what he has approved and what he wants to see, because that he is where the buck stops. So if the company wants something and he doesn't, it's not going to necessarily happen. I'm not saying it can't, and I'm not saying it shouldn't. I'm just saying, knowing the players that I do, and knowing the fact that Vince sets the tone. So, like I said, if it comes to a world champion, Vince needs to believe that that guy can carry the company. Not just can that guy carry the company, but Vince needs to believe that. And I guess we haven't seen that yet. Um, and, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, excusing it. I'm merely oh, no, saying, no. you know what I mean? I'm just yeah, saying I, that, I, that, is, that is what it is. And it, it is, you know, it because – he is the company, and nothing happens in that company without his, without his uh, approval or say-so. So that's where I think the problem is because, you know, this is not the first time that I have heard this, um, and I don't think what you're saying is necessarily uh, uh, wrong. I mean, let me just point throw one thing out there. We've been watching a lot of the NXT call-ups lately. You know, since mm-hmm. WrestleMania, a lot of talent from NXT. One in particular, I think that they have absolutely harmed almost beyond recognition. And I'm not saying they were trying to harm uh, uh, Apollo Crews. What I'm saying is they've given him nothing. They've given him absolutely nothing to get over with except a smile. And you need a hell of a lot more than a smile 
and a kick-ass uh, talent in the ring to get over with the fans. And they've given him nothing. They've given him no story. And he is floundering. And it's a crime because he is somebody who could be that guy you're talking about. But the, the, it, the creative, um, I believe, has been far from inspiring over the past couple of years. And even though I've been seeing glimmers of improvements or glimmers of a little bit more uh, attention being paid recently, um, still very uninspired and very uh, difficult to get swept up in the emotion of what's happening. And I, like I said, I use that as a perfect example because I think that Apollo Crews, they have given him absolutely nothing. And now in the minds of the people, the officials in WWE, it's like, oh, well, he's not getting over. He's, you know, this, he's, he's not working out. Um, well, he's not working out because you haven't given him anything to get over with. But I think that, you know, again, if you had better creative, you might, have, you might be in a very different place right now. If he was, if he was in a kicker right now, a, a badass that, you know, doesn't back down from anybody, I, I think that he'd be in a much different place right now, except, you know, now, you know, what he, and, and I think it was just poor production this past Monday, but, you know, one segment, he's getting laid out in the back uh, um, by Sheamus, and then, you know, segment or two later, he comes out smiling for his match. And I think that's just bad production. I think they didn't remind him, oh, don't forget, you just got beat up in the back because they probably pre-taped that. Um, but however the WWE you stretch, does not do any good continuity these days, Ed. Come on now. <laughs> good continuity. I'd take bad continuity at this point, any continuity. But, yes, you're right. You're right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why, that's why we still have Shane McMahon on the TV, even though as of WrestleMania stipulation, he should have been long gone. So, uh, 